Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into the very first video episode of Entrepreneur Escape Pod. I'm your host, Melissa Rittenhouse. Uh, in today's episode, we have an incredible guest named James Shu. He is the CEO and executive producer of VRLU Productions, a virtual reality production company. He's also a motivational speaker and an author of the books, Mobilizing People and How to Eat Your Way to Six Figures. So in this interview, we talk a lot about what an entrepreneur means, how James got his start, how he became an entrepreneur. And also we talk a lot about the power of networking and also VR and Web3 and the metaverse and what all of that means. So uh, if you're interested in metaverse, Web3 technologies, definitely tune into this podcast. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the interview with James. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Entrepreneur Escape Pod. I'm here with James Shu. He is the CEO and executive producer of VR Lou. So thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm excited to have you. Thank you for having you. me. I am honored to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited to have you. I've seen you speak a few times at your Mobilizing People events, and I just knew you'd be an amazing guest. So I'm really glad I got you here, and I'm happy you're my first filmed guest as well. So. I am honored, and we get to work out together. Yeah. which is how we met and mm -hmm. that's been a blast. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, honestly, I I think I said this on my last podcast too because I talked about just meeting people in Las Vegas and like I've met a lot of really awesome people working out <laughs> and I'm like and so I tell people I'm like, you know, I didn't really start going to F45 or going to the gym to like meet people, but then it just ended up happening and I I would recommend it if someone's wants to work out but wants to be social, definitely F45 is great or just any gym that sparks your interest. Yeah. Yes, I think, yeah, F45 specifically, the gold mine, such positive people. And I'm sure we can go into other details about price points and stuff and why that the people that we meet are there. But it's awesome. Oh, yeah. So shout out F45 Arts District. <laughs> yeah, cool. And then um, I guess like my first question and one question I like to ask most of my guests is how what do you think? How do you define the word entrepreneur? And what does that mean to you? You know, when you prep me on this, I didn't even, I don't even know how to answer it other than it's people who are maybe have some psychological problems <laughs> that decide that they can't work at jobs yeah, or they can't work at traditional nine to five type of schedules. And they feel <laughs> whether or not it happens or not, that they can be successful at growing or building some type of business for themselves. So I don't even know. The first time I remember someone calling me an entrepreneur, I actually looked at them wondering, and, you know, this is maybe I'm aging myself, but I, from at least my knowledge, the word entrepreneur wasn't used the way it is today. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, you're an entrepreneur. And I was just like, you know, is that a good thing? He's like, yeah, you work for yourself and you build your own business. I was like, yes, that is what I do. So I don't even know how to answer it other than, you know, we work for ourselves. We grow business and we feel we have this passion inside of ourselves that we can uh, build enough value that the public feels is worth purchasing. Right. Yeah, I <laughs> totally know what you mean, because I feel like when even when I was starting this podcast, it kind of hit me that I'm like, wow, I actually know a lot more entrepreneurs than I thought because people who are, you know, obviously like online business owners, influencers, but even like personal trainers are kind of entrepreneurs, yes. artists, musicians, I think are very entrepreneurial because, you know, they don't, they have to build the audience themselves. So it's, it's very like, a, it can be a broad definition. Yeah. If you're not guaranteed pay, you're an entrepreneur in my book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then um, tell us a little bit about your story growing up. I know you've spoken about this at some of your mobilizing people events, but it's such an awesome story. How, like, what was your life like growing up in Las Vegas? And then what kind of sparked that entrepreneurial drive in you? I'll try to do the shortest version yeah. possible, but I, my mom used to own a motel 25 minutes uh, north of where we're at right now mm -hmm. called Townie and Country Motel. And we grew up there. And I say this all the time in my speeches, but so many times I hear people always say the phrase, I knew I could be successful or I knew I'd be more. Or, I knew that I was destined for success. And it's so funny because when I grew up, that's literally the last thing I even thought in my head was I grew up, my mom owned a motel. It was a very small 31 unit motel. So it wasn't like we were this. It's not like if you owned MGM, you're rich. Yeah. Our motel was if we made 300 bucks a day, you know, we'd be celebrating. That was a really good day for us. So growing up at the motel, that's just what I thought life was. I honestly thought that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And that was, I would raise a family like my mom and dad did. And that was me the end of the story. My father ended up getting cancer. 
And then, so he got really sick. So we bought a house for the first time. And then my mom and I took over full-time hotel, which was my mom did 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then I did 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I lived there till I was 24. You know, yeah. I shared a bed with my mom uh, when we were tired or if, if one of us just ha- was going to get knocked out from our shift, you know, we slept in the same bed till 24 and it was just a normal thing for me. And it was a normal thing to go to middle school. I would typically would always be the last kid picked up. My mom would sometimes be an hour late. And I, and again, I never even blamed her for these things because I knew she was working at the motel. It wasn't because she was forgot or drunk or passed out. She was just working and I would do that and go straight to the motel. I never had friends because again, we just, we weren't allowed to go to parties because we needed to do the the family business and yeah. do that. And when I turned 19, I met a mentor for the first time before I even knew again what the word mentor meant. And he was making a ridiculous amount of money speaking uh, five figures a month. And I was just like, I don't understand. My my mom and I make $300 a day um, times 30 days. That's nine grand. And you make more speaking one day out of the month. It's, it's, it's insulting. Yeah. And I want to do it. How right. do I How do I do it too? And, and from there, I started learning and he introduced me to other mentors. And I met a lot of people that were extremely successful financially. And they basically taught me how to raise value for yourself and how to do these things that I never even realized were things, I guess, you know, but there are things that you can do to make people like you better or be more likable or create value and create business. And it's been an amazing ride. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one thing I get a lot when I have seen you speak. And one thing that I feel like is very inspirational is like you really kind of hone in on like, what is just some like thing anyone can do? Like, cause I think sometimes people feel like maybe they can't be an entrepreneur. So like, oh, well I need, you know, I don't have the money or I don't have the time or like whatever it is. But then I feel like, um, and that's kind of one of the things I like wanted to ask you about too, was you told a story last time about how you started your first business, the video production business, and like all these small steps you took to get there. And then, uh, so I don't know, do you mind like kind of telling the story a little bit again? Cause I really liked it. And it just shows like, you know, it's a lot of times it is those small steps when you're not in a position where you have like a lot of leverage that can really, you can still do things and it makes a big difference. Yes. So my mentor, Frederick, he was like, okay, so what are you into? And I said, I, I'm into movies. Mm-hmm. And I'm into, and I still am, yeah. I'm into movies and I'm into eating food. I, I love food. He's like, okay, we can create a business. I said, okay, how? He's like, well, you need to come out with a video production company. And I said to him, you know, because when I think video production company, I think Warner Brothers. Yeah. Okay? That's what I'm thinking, Melissa. I'm not thinking what he was thinking. He's like, I was like, okay, so I don't know how to work a camera. And I guess I'm aging myself again. This is before smartphones existed. So he's like, okay buy a camera, a cheap one where you can video record. So I go to Best Buy, I bought a Sony Vloggy and I called him and I said, okay, I bought it. He was like, great, film some stuff. I said, what? He's like, anything. And I said, okay. So I started filming the strip and then I called him like a couple days later. I was like, okay, I got all the footage. I was like, now what? He's like, edit it. I was like, how do you edit it? I was like, I have no idea. He's like, uh, I'll teach you. I was like, okay, perfect. He's like, do you have your notes out? I was like, yes. I was, he's like, okay, write this down go to G O O G L E. And I was like, okay. He's like, just Google it. He's like, just James, just Google it and figure it out. I was like, okay. And then I call him a day later. And I was like, okay, it looks like I have to buy an editing software. And I'm not kidding. I didn't even realize, yeah, you need a laptop and then you need editing software. And then you need all these things. These are just things I just, I guess, when you don't know something, you don't know. Yeah. You know, that really is the truth. You don't know what you don't know. And so I had no money. And in Las Vegas, we have a place called Zia Records, which is a place you can sell all your stuff. And again, I I love movies. So I sold all my back then DVDs. And I was so it was one of the hardest things I had to do. So that's probably a good lesson for people is you have to be able to sacrifice, you have to be willing to do that may sound stupid. But those DVDs took me forever, years and years and years. And it meant something to me. I got rid of all of them. I bought a MacBook Air. I bought Final Cut for $299, I think it was. And I uploaded everything, Googled it. And he was like, and I made a video. I showed it to him. Quite embarrassing. Mm-hmm. I said, this is my movie. And he's like, okay, now what you need to do is make me 100 more. 
I was like, oh my gosh, I got a hundred more. What? He's like, of that. I was like, okay. And see, he's like doing all these lessons to me. And the point of that was just to get better. Yeah. And so I made, um, I, I don't even remember, but if I, if I had a guess, I made like another 25. He's like, okay, you're ready. I was like, ready for what? He's like, bring that big smile of yours. Go to your local restaurant and tell them that you're a professional video camera, a video production company. And this was uh, 12 years ago. And pitch them $500 and get him to pay you $500 to make a movie on his food. And I looked at him and I said, oh my gosh. I was like, okay. And I got lucky. The very first business I walked to, walked into Crab Corner, shout out to John Simone. I pitched him and I said, hey, I'm a professional video crew, camera production company. And I'm gonna, I would love to make a commercial on your food. He literally looked at me, Melissa, and was like, okay, do it. Yeah. <laughs> and he paid me $500. Yeah. And it was probably the crappiest video I've ever made. <laughs> and he, he made it for me. And, or I mean, I made it for him. He paid me $500 and I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I just made $500. I still live at the motel, but I'm going to get filthy rich. Yeah. You know, that's, that's all I thought in my head. And next thing you know, I started telling people I own a video production company here in Las Vegas. And you know, now it's turned into a few million dollars. Yeah, that's so cool. I know because it's. I bet you it is, it is kind of nerve wracking. Like you probably went into it thinking, okay, like I'm gonna have to sell him on it. And if he was the fact that he was like, okay, do it, then that almost like brings up another thing. Like, oh man, now I actually have to do it. <laughs> the power of confidence. Yeah. And what that can instill in you. It's it is amazing. Yeah, and it, it kind of reminds me of what you talk about in your book, uh, how to eat your way to a six figure income. It's like a similar concept in a sense. It's still like talking to business owners, talking to restaurant owners, and uh, well, okay, one thing you mentioned actually in the intro of the book that I want to touch on is that um, you mentioned you've worked with a bunch of different mentors, some of them billionaires, but all really successful and that they've become successful in different ways, but the fundamental principles of success is pretty similar no matter what industry they became successful in. So like, what are some of those uh, principles of success, would you say, that you've picked up from all of them? Yes. So uh, I've been mentored by 15 people worth over 100 million, four billionaires. And when I first met Frederick, who is a nine-figure earner, when I met him, he started spitting different fundamentals to me of what is success and how do you do that? And I honestly was this little kid who was just like, wow, <laughs> yeah, that's how you become successful? Wow. And then I started really investing, like uh, before Jordans were cool, and how, how it is now, I used to have um, maybe 40 pairs of Jordans and I had to get rid of all of them because I, need, I needed money because I got sold on. There, there are fundamentals, basic building blocks, basic rudiments, basic ideologies of how to become successful. And if you do those things, you can become successful. Like I, I believe that after I met this guy, he totally brainwashed me in a wonderful way that you can be, anyone can be successful. And then so these, and then so I go to seminar number two, three, four, five, and I start meeting all these people. They legitimately are all saying the same things. And some of those things are uh, having a positive mindset, you know, yeah. understanding that you're going to get uh, the power of rejection, uh, understanding toxic dream stealers, which your chapter is in mobilizing people, my first <laughs> book. Um, under, so mindset, positive attitude, uh, the power of charisma, the power of a smile the power of looking someone in the eye, the power of just saying someone's name, Melissa, the power of just um, these type of things. They all basically said the same thing. And it's crazy because all these successful people all became successful uh, in different industries. They don't know each other. They'll probably never meet each other ever. And they all said the same things. And myself, if anyone would consider what I've done successful, I can at least attest to it's the same things that it's, it's having that positive attitude. Um, working hard, of course. You, of course, you have to work hard. That, but that should be like the default. You know, that should yeah. be the given. You know, in in math. So there is the given of working hard and all that stuff. But having that positive attitude does make a difference. There is a a personal development thing called the secret. Mm -hmm. When I first saw, I liked it until I started realizing people started actually believing that all I have to do is manifest it, and I'm gonna get a parking spot. That that's where I. I, I start to get lost because I think people forget the most important part of success is working. Yeah. You have to be the guy that guy or girl or person that just goes out there and does the work. And then if you have that positive attitude, if you have a positive mindset, if you understand like what I call the Cinderella story and how things just don't just happen just like it did in Cinderella, 
you will be successful in time. Yeah, totally. I, I, I definitely can see that because I feel like we've all too, like, have you ever had an experience where it's like you go to someone, maybe, I don't know, just get your haircut or whatever. And like, you could tell they have a bad attitude and part of you is just like, oh, I don't want to come back. Or, yep. <laughs> you know? Yes, it's 100%. Like, yeah. So th- that I think is like one of those things that it seems small, but it like makes a big difference. <laughs> and then um, kind of, uh, well, I guess sort of on that note. Um, so at your, in your books and at your events and kind of along the same lines, you talk about the importance of networking and building connections. What are some aspects of networking that are really powerful that you feel like people probably overlook? If you want to become rich and successful and rich and successful is whatever your definition is. If you become a master master networker, you will probably be in a position where you don't ever have to work for someone if you choose not to. Networking has made my entire career. Um, I own a video production company. The gentleman who owns this studio is probably a better videographer than my team is. Probably. Right. Um, Because and and that doesn't even matter because, again, it's it really it's. Getting hired and doing all these things is totally dependent on, on if people like you and if you know people. Like even right when I walked in, I knew the owner of the place. Yeah. You know, and, and that's you need to be able to network with people and hopefully be likable to the point where him or her can look at you and say, hey, how are you? Versus, oh, my God, get out of my building. Yeah. You know, I, I don't care what you're paying <laughs> this me. Guy. You're, you're, yeah, this guy. You're not in here. <laughs> so I, I think it's totally dependent on the likability factor. Yeah. And um, one of my mentors calls it being a chameleon. And being a chameleon doesn't mean you're being fake. It just understands that when you go into a library, it's not you're being fake. If you're being quiet, that's just the rules. If you go into a library, you need to shut up, for lack of better words. That's just be quiet. That's just how the rules of the library is. When you're at uh, Omnia, we can go crazy. I can scream and yell like I do at F45. And it's totally a normal thing to do that in Omnia because you have to be a chameleon. You have to understand the environment you're in. And I feel like people are the same. I can only talk to Melissa so well. Unfortunately for you, now that we're friends, as we get to know each other over the next five, 10 years, then I'm going to become a different James and I'll become probably loud or annoying. But then you kind of get to the point where, oh, that's James. Yeah. You know, so I feel like you have to, if you, the more you network, the better you are. And I often share this in mobilizing people that if you're trying to get a gig and you're pitching uh, $2,000 uh, $2, for it, and there's another person that's pitching the gig that's better than you. And they're charging 15. Not only are they better and they're charging less, that doesn't mean you're not going to get hired because if that person's attitude is just stinky attitude, it just sucks. Um, sometimes the more, the more expensive one or the more likable one will get hired because at the end of the day, if you're going to pay someone for whatever you're going to pay them for, you better like them. You yeah. Know? So that's gone such a, a far away with me where I can tell you how many gigs I've gone just purely based on the person just knew me. Yeah. And I think you do that really well in like unexpected ways too, like with the movie premieres and with things like, like you talk about in the, how to eat your way to six figure income that was organizing a lot of restaurant events. And so then, um, it's not just like networking with business owners, but you know, pretty much all kinds of people in the community. And then there's a lot of value in in that as well. And I think, you know, maybe some people think like, oh, I'm not networking with the right people or whatever that might be. But then it's like, hey, there's value in networking with essentially everyone in a sense. Yeah. Facebook. Um, do you remember like a six degrees of separation or the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Yeah. How uh, You can get to anyone within uh, six, six people. Uh, Facebook says it's uh, 2.9 hops. And so each hop is one person. Mm-hmm. So they, they say it's now less than three people. You can get to anyone you want in the entire world. And because of that, my whole thing is, one, I like, I actually like people. Yeah. Like, I, I genuinely like people. I genuinely like working out with you. I, you know, it's fun to me working out where we work out and I, I enjoy people. So I like to put on events to be able to curate relationships and put on events such as movie premieres or things where it's a low cost entry. Anybody can go versus if I do it at a nice restaurant where the bill's going to be $75, you know, I may not know hundred people that are want to spend that particular day $75 versus a movie premiere. I like it because it's, it's cheap entry point, 12 bucks, make a deal with the theater. Friends get it cheaper than the actual theater itself. And then now everyone can come together and then you put on, put on this event. People, they like you. Yeah. You know, they're like, Oh, that was fun. Thanks for inviting me. And then hopefully from their point, that point, uh, in this scenario, if Melissa knows somebody that wants to do anything in crypto, if she knows anyone that wants to do a blockchain, app development, VR, anything like that, hopefully Melissa thinks, oh, 
My friend James says that you should think of him, you know, and then getting that word of mouth because the word of mouth is going to be more popular and more powerful than a Google ad or an Instagram ad. You know, it's a direct relationship. So I like doing personal networking events together so we can uh, congregate together, have fun together and show each other value of how we can help each other's businesses. Yeah, totally. I feel like especially I don't know if it's maybe because of everything that happened last year. So I'm like, I feel like networking in person is like a little underrated these days, but it's very powerful and like even more powerful, I think. Yeah. Than like necessarily ads, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, okay, cool. I think our next generation real quick too, is going to be in some trouble, to be honest with you. Yeah. They're so used to texting that if me and you go on a date, Melissa, and we've never met each other and we grew up with this culture, Mm -hmm. when we're in front of each other, I don't even know if we're going to know how to talk to each other. Yeah, I know it's it will definitely be different. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of funny because like I I do think about like I'm like part of me always feels like, man, I'm really glad in a way that I sort of went through high school before. the I, Well, now I'm aging myself before the iPhone was invented. <laughs> I mean, it came out when I was like a senior, but I was like pretty much done with it at that point. And like social media wasn't really a thing until I had yeah. pretty much graduated. So it's like in a way I'm like, God, I'm so glad <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, like, I didn't have to have that like added I don't know. I mean, it's funny because like I remember liking it, like things like MySpace and Facebook when I was in high school, but it didn't feel as like invasive in a way. <laughs> like, yes. so I don't know. I'm, I I feel like it is, there is a difference, but um, yeah, totally. I mean, um, yeah, I think people just, yeah, like networking in person is a little undervalued and um, but it's very powerful, like I said. And then hopefully I hopefully younger people see the value. I don't know. Younger people always surprise me <laughs> when I talk to them. They're I don't know. Uh, they're not always what I expect them to be <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so, but um, actually, OK, so tell us about your company, VR Lou, like how you came up with the concept and what co- projects you guys are currently working on. Well, I can't take credit. Uh, my business partner. He was he he does a lot of business in Korea, and he was on the sh- uh, on the set of a K-pop music video, and so they were filming it. He was enjoying it, and he looked at the camera, and it was, it was a circular sphere with six cameras on there. And he was like, "Hey, what what is that?" He's like, "Oh, that we're filming the music video also in VR." He's like, "Oh, wow, what would that look like?" He's like, "Well, we want to make it so when you have your headset on, you feel like you're right next to the dancers, you know." So if Melissa's here you know, and you're doing the choreo, the choreo mm-hmm. and you have your headset on, you're literally in the middle of all the dancers. So you literally feel like you're in the music video. And he's like, oh, I can't wait to see that. When will that be done? He's like, oh, we're not actually going to produce it. And he was just like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, we literally have thousands of hours of VR content and not one of those videos have ever been produced. Wow. He's like, <laughs> what's the point? He's like, oh, VR will be big one day. And he's like, oh. So he literally comes back to um, America calls me or a Vegas calls me and is like, Hey, we're meeting up. And we meet at the Starbucks in a uh, Boca park in Summerlin. Yeah. And we get there at something like eight o'clock. We left at 3 AM outside. Wow. Sitting there, and he's, just, <laughs> he's just like pitching me and sharing with me all these amazing ideas. And he's like, do you know how to film in 360 VR? I said, no. He's like, do you know how to build the app? I said, no. He's like, can you? I was like, I guess. I mean, not right now, but I guess. And um, there was a big six month learning curve and got all my friends, uh, thanks to networking, got all my friends together and we built VR Lou. And uh, today, uh, 32 months later, we're the largest 360 VR repository of personal development in the entire world in virtual reality, where we find people who are uh, the best at what they do. Uh, If you know motivational speaking, you've heard of Les Brown. If you are familiar with um, uh, bar, wor- bar uh, working out bar. Yeah. Uh, you've heard of Tracy Mallet, Lisa Hubbard with Pilates, um, Emily, um, Emily and um, Junior when it comes to salsa dancing. Like we have over 100 of the best uh, teachers sharing everything they do, but it's in 360 VR. Yeah, it's so cool. It kind of remind, reminds me of like masterclass yes. so, <laughs> a little bit when I went on. And Same then, thing. Yeah. And then it's really cool how it's in VR. And I noticed too, I, it makes sense with the, how you said your business partner went to Korea. Cause I was like, oh man, I'm like, they have a lot of like K-pop and Korean uh, influencers on here mm-hmm. too. Yes. On <laughs> the Korea yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. So he, he hired um, uh, a woman by the name of Sujin Park, mm-hmm. who was uh, something like the equivalent of the editor-in-chief for Vogue Korea. Yeah. Big time. 
So I don't know how I got in the mix, but <laughs> yeah, she was big. T- she is big time. And so she handled all the, the Korea side in Japan and I, I, I handle America. Yeah, so cool. I know. I've never been to Korea, but it, every time I see v- videos of it, I'm like, I have to go. It looks so cool. Let's just get rich, Ray, so we can go together. <laughs> I know, right? I've never uh, been either. Yeah, I know. Well, I've had friends who've been to other parts, like Japan and places, and they loved it. But I don't, well, I'm actually used to live with a few Korean people a while ago. So, but they, everything they said just made it sound even cooler. But um, cool. And then I guess kind of on that note, you're, so your next event, it's not going to be a mobilizing people event. You're doing something different. It's called uh, the Wonder Workshop. And it's going to be, for anyone who's in the Las Vegas area, it's this. It's not this Saturday, next Saturday, July 16th, uh, 1 p.m. And the workshop is all about the metaverse and how it can be used for product development, digital marketing. So how do, would you how would you define the metaverse? And then what role do you think VR plays into it? I think it's going to be interesting to see you. Uh, as it transforms, mm-hmm. I think whatever I'm going to say right now will be 100% outdated <laughs> and old thinking, uh, literally probably six months from today or a year from today. But, you know, the metaverse is going to be interesting to see if all these companies, i.e. Uh, Meta, Facebook, yeah, uh, Apple, uh, probably one day, um, they say no, but I don't believe that necessarily. And, as, you know, huge, large companies from China, I'm obviously already doing what they're doing. And all these large companies, if we can all get along and create one singular world, or if it's just really going to be its own, each company's its own world, which it would be just cooler if it all just connected, where whatever meta did, you could cross into the meta world, even if you're in another world. And be able to see these storefronts and brands and people and avatars and meeting new best friends that you've never would have had the chance of ever meeting. You know, I often even talk about mobilizing people like the reason why to be successful and to become wealthy is not for the greed of saying you have a lot of money and being Scrooge McDuck and being in a money bin and swimming. The point of it is to, you know, see the world, whether you believe in God or the universe or, you know, whatever higher deity that you believe in, you know, this world is this big for a reason. Let's see it. And the metaverse, you know, and will it will will bad people do bad things and everything? Yes. So will there be bad things that will happen because of the metaverse? Of course, just like all things. But I think the wonderful part, at least to me, like, just because I like people, is you're going to be in the metaverse. You're going to be singing karaoke. And you're going to meet this new best guy or girlfriend that is doing it from India that you never would have met. And you can become best friends with this person. And who knows, maybe one day you visit them or they visit you. And being in this, you know, 360 world where you know, being able to just, the idea of Ready Player One for me really was like the best example of, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> could, could that really be it, Melissa? Like, yeah. could that really be what it's like? That It's amazing. It looks amazing to me, no? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've I seen that movie. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I think there's a lot of aspects to that film. I know it's like they kind of portray it in a dark way at first, but like, uh, I do think there were a lot of aspects to that film that I was like, oh, yeah, once this gets going, it will be really cool. <laughs> it looked amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know? It looked freaking amazing. So, yeah, with the added uh, technology of virtual reality. Yeah. And Apple's, you know, probably going to announce their VR headset finally uh, at WWDC at the end of this year, probably, uh, rumor says. And then with a release probably at the end of next year, 2023, I feel like once Apple puts their stamp on it, then the rest of the world says, oh, okay, VR is cool. Yeah. You know, and then that's where VR loose slides in. But anyway, my point is, yeah, I think once VR, I think once VR gets to the point where the masses, masses are using it, I, f- I don't feel like it's there yet. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But most people I speak to don't own headsets, you know, and I'm literally, I have a VR app. So, you know, we yeah. talk a lot about it. And most people I know don't have VR headsets. So once we get past that part, of the diffusion of innovations theory. Once we get past that that hedge part and it gets past all the the norms, you know, it's gonna be an exciting thing to build to incorporate VR 360 and seeing that technology grow where it can get to the point where you can be in your 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 home and you can go to different stores. You can go to your Nike town and you can go to the Amazon world and you can go to the meta world and you can go to all these different worlds and freely walk around and run into people and see people. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Do you think um, perhaps like VR, the VR world and maybe like the internet will just become almost like one, one in the same? Like you won't necessarily go home, go on your laptops, 
go on the internet and then put your headset on, it will all be one, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Scary to think about. I, you know, I, 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 I don't, I mean, for now, I would say it'll be always separate. Yeah. But who knows? I know, right? The world's nuts, <laughs> Melissa. Yeah. I mean, especially if they can get the headset smaller, maybe people would just be like scrolling on the headset <laughs> rather than on their phone. Who knows? But um, I guess like what, can you share a little bit about like what you plan on discussing at the event and what you hope the audience will take away from it? Yes. My segment is going to be VR, virtual reality, and all the endeavors that we went through when it comes to VR Lou. And we're going to share the history of VR Lou. And the the hopes of the the workshop in general is to just educate people on what is going on in these industries. So I'm going to be talking about virtual reality. Taylor Spiegel is going to be going over the metaverse uh, in general. Uh, Dylan Stroud is going to be going over app development. And then Emily Chandler is going to be going over product development. So no matter what happens to the with the metaverse, virtual reality and all that, the one thing that will never stop is you're going to need product development. So all entrepreneurs out there one, how do you position, position yourself for the metaverse? And I know that there's people who are going to hear this podcast that are thinking, well, I don't have the big budget of a Nike. You know, Nike just entered the metaverse. Budweiser is going into NFTs, which we'll talk about also. Um, so you have all these companies now doing the NFT world and then mixing with the metaverse and how we can all come together and earn to play and crypto and, you know, all these things. A lot of people feel like, one, it's overwhelming. And two, I'm not positioned for that. I'm just normal me when again that's just not the reality the reality is the if you position yourself go to things like this it doesn't have to be ours but i mean i would go to it <laughs> but yeah. it, going to these things though just to open up your mind and really see wow i can position myself for what the future is i missed out on facebook i missed out on tesla uh, my entire family has made quite a lot of money because of tesla i missed out on that um, I missed out on Apple. I missed out. I can make a whole list of all these things I missed out on. So if you or if you're anything like I am, you're thinking, "Wow, I missed out on those things too." I missed out on real estate in the '80s, uh, in the '70s. I missed out. On, I missed out in Disneyland in the '50s because I wasn't even born yet. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I missed out on all these things. And if you're thinking I did too, the metaverse is not here yet. Well, let me phrase that: it's here, but you can still position yourself for the future and really set up your family tree if you want to. Nice. Um, and then I guess we you mentioned NFTs a little bit in crypto. So I was going to say, like, what do you think the metaverse, uh, how do you think it's related to Web3, NFTs, crypto? And are they closely related to each other? Or do you think there's important things that keep that separate them? And then uh, so, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Do you think they are all kind of inter intertwined or do you think they have like distinct differences? Yeah, I definitely th think they're all intertwined. There are Web3 portals already open that are um, based off laptop, laptop mm -hmm. usage. So when we think Web3, you think like metaverse, right? You think going into the world where the technology is not quite there yet for everyone to be able to use it in that fashion. So having your laptop in your, I'm sorry, having your website set up so you can be on a laptop and you can already be in the metaverse. And so they're one of our, well, we're not, we're not a contract yet. So I hope we do. But one of our clients that we've, that we're, we signed an NDA with, so I'll be careful with what I say, but they've already created a Web3 portal and it's it's awesome. And with a shopping mall. And, you know, and, and when I say, and when I, when a lot of people say NFTs, I think a lot of people think artwork yeah. when they hear the word NFT, but it's going to be more than that. It's going to be when Melissa buys a, I'll just use uh, a car and you get the, not pink slip, you get a, what do you call it when you a own title? a title? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> when you get your title, it'll be an NFT. Yeah, you know it'll, that's how it'll be minted. Um, when you get your deed to a home, deed. Yeah, I think it's a deed. deed. When you get your deed, <laughs> I don't know. Or, I don't know. But when you own, when you finally own <laughs> yeah. your home and you get that piece of paper, that can be an NFT. You know, so I mean, I can give you another thousand examples of how it's it's not just artwork. It'll yeah. always it will be artwork, and I'm sure people will continue to make fortunes, even though NFTs have severely, just like everything, at least the time of this recording, you know, has severely crashed the stock market, crypto, and all that. But you know, it's like all things, I'm sure it'll bounce back and it'll be used for so much more. So do I think that they're all going to be intertwined 100% non-negotiable, non-debatable? I do think that. And, you know, with blockchain and with uh, the point of what... There are people mad, though, because the point of crypto, a lot of, a lot of it was so you could just transfer the money and it wasn't controlled by like how the stock market feels and all that. But now that 
crypto has taken a dive. Bitcoin specifically went from what 70, 80,000 to now 17, 19, 20,000. And it's, it's now being controlled again, kind of like stock. People aren't happy with that. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think, I, I don't know. It's, it, it's a little different from how I think it's different than a stock in some ways, but yeah, I guess it is still tied to the market in, in a sense. But I mean, uh, I do think if you're making, if you're having transactions in, in a metaverse or web three, it does make sense to use something like crypto because you could, even though the, I guess, exchange the dollar, what the dollar amount is tethered to might be it. I don't know. Always going up and down. I don't know. I, I, I don't really, I, I feel like with time it will stabilize more. Agreed. Yeah. And it's then quite dangerous too, because crypto, t- it, when I say dangerous, I mean, um, it's like poker chips, more gambling. Yeah. You don't realize that you're holding a hundred dollars. You know, yeah. if you have four, even if it's five dollars and you have 10 of them, that's 50 bucks. Versus if I had a $50 bill, I might be a little resistant to buy something or spend it. Versus when you're playing, when you're gambling, you just throw that money away and it didn't even yeah. matter. And I realized, at least for myself, I'll speak for myself, crypto has been very similar where you have these Solanas, you know, and you have like, oh, well, I have five of them. Yeah, but each one's worth 50 bucks. That's 250. And normally you wouldn't spend 250 like that. And now you just don't care, James. Yeah, you know, so it is a little dangerous in that sense. Yeah, that's true. I feel like I I could kind of be that way with um maybe other thing other online purchases too because you just feel like oh it's I'm not yeah I don't know the money just feels I don't know <laughs> yeah it's digital it's on a credit card it's all like whatever <laughs> it doesn't scary. it doesn't feel real I mean I don't want to say it doesn't feel real but like it's definitely different than if you had cash cause, yes because so. you see that cash go away you're like yeah. oh maybe I should nope this. I know. And it's like, it's interesting too. like side note with like the poker chips and stuff, how it's like even a thousand dollar chip feels and looks the same almost as like a five dollar chip. Yes. <laughs> and, yes, absolutely. And then uh, I, I mean, I definitely think that's by design. So it's like you don't feel like you're gambling a lot of money. <laughs> so, yes, I know. Well, hey, I don't know. I guess it works for them. But um, yeah, so I know I've heard like with NFTs too, people using it in for luxury clothes. So like if you buy a Louis Vuitton bag, like, you know, it's a re- if you get the, the yep. you'll have a proof of purchase. Like, oh, it's, this is a real B- Louis Vuitton. It's yep. not a fake. Cause I know that's like one thing yes. people worry about with designer clothes a lot. Yes. <laughs> it's knockoffs. So yeah, absolutely. So yeah. yeah, yeah. That's just a great example. There's so many different things that the NFT can be used for the, but I don't think people realize that right now. Yeah. I think, or when I say most, when I say people, I mean, um, the vast majority of people, they just think it's artwork. And it is going to be, it's far more than just that. Nice. And then um, do you think these new technologies will continue to grow together? Or do you see them like maybe taking, oh, sorry, hit the mic, uh, like diverging in different directions as well? Both. Yeah. Yeah. I think right now we have, we see things that are good for one thing and that's going to be something completely different five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from today. And it's going to keep on uh, pivoting depending on what the market says. You know, no, no matter how brilliant someone may think someone is or, you know, we'll use Meta as an example. Meta, Facebook, you know, they're in a lot of trouble. You know, I think most surveys, at least from what I've seen, so I could be wrong on this, but most surveys that I've seen, if you ask the question, do you trust Facebook? Most people say, no, I don't trust them because they are marketed or branded now as they have all your information. They sell it, you know, yeah. because of the leaks that, that have shown them doing things that, is the opposite of what we believe that our information was being used for. Granted, I don't know why we're mad about it considering we're the ones that gave it all to them, but, but I digress. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see even such a powerful company like Meta and with them taking over, well, Oculus, you know, but no longer called Oculus Meta. It's going to be so interesting, you know, can they really pivot to VR? Because Facebook, they, they got social media, they got rich, great. They missed the whole smartphone thing, you know. And they watched Apple literally become one of the most powerful companies in the world, consistently reviewed as the most influential, most powerful brand in the world, has more cash. Apple has more cash than any other company in the entire planet Earth. You know, and, and they missed that whole smartphone thing. They easily could have been involved in that too. And the only two that came out of that was really um, Google Android, you know, Samsung's uh, Google yeah. Android and Apple. That's what most people's phones are. So they missed that whole trend. They're really hoping VR is the trend in they're going to have to start pivoting to see what the market says. So answer your question, sorry to give a long winded answer, but you know, I, I feel like the same thing. It's like, 
right now we're that's why it's such a perfect opportunity for everybody because you could literally get yeah. there's nothing set in stone right now. You know, for a new company to smart start smartphones today, probably not smart. You're probably not going to beat Apple. And the minute you get any momentum, they can buy you out if they really wanted to. You know, so right now we're in this interesting time where everything's in flux. Everything's jacked. Stock market's low. <laughs> crypto's jacked. Yeah. NFTs are being called art and that's the only thing it's good for. Metaverse is just the beginning. No one even really knows what the metaverse is other than... I don't even know if anyone knows what the really the metaverse is, including myself, <laughs> you know, so we can design that. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I feel like I, I understand the basics, but I'm I even feel like I'm like, do I really know what this is? Myself like, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I But I do think uh, the one thing with, I guess you could say, like Web3 technologies, maybe like including NFTs and so on is like I have heard some people talk about some really interesting ways in which it can be used. And I do think it is kind of like part of the one of the things that's sort of like leading us down this more interesting like path in the future where it's um, where it's like every individual can be, I don't know. I don't know how like the proper way to say it is like decentralized in a way. Like, you don't, there's, it takes away a lot of gatekeepers. Cause like, let's say you're, you know, like a musician and it's, you don't, and it's kind of this way now, but I think we'll just be this way even more so in the future. Like in the past, it was like, okay, well, if you want to sell a record, like you need to be signed to a label and like go through this whole process and you have to, there's all these gatekeepers. Like you have to have someone that likes you and wants to actually put your music on a record or on a CD. But now it's like, you can really just put it out there. And just as long as you can be direct to the consumer and you can end up making more money that way. Cause even if you're selling the product for like the same or less than you would, in the past and so I feel like at, with time it, it that will just become more and more of a, a thing and I feel like there will be like more entrepreneurs like people will be more entrepreneurial because it'll be easier just to go directly to a customer in yeah. a sense and you'll have the audience will be the whole world potentially not just like you're yep. not going to be confined to just America or just Las Vegas or whatever so <laughs> our one of our things we're doing with VRLU is called VRLU Live mm -hmm. and we're just waiting for 5G to get better but it's basically uh, and hopefully our first artist we'll officially sign. So I guess exclusive, but it's not even signed. So it doesn't matter. But it's Boys the Men, where Boys the Men's going to do a concert. And once Beerloo Live, that department, or one that, once that section of Beerloo's live, you can pay your 40 bucks or whatever we're going to charge for the concert. And you'll be at home with your headset on and you're going to see Boys the Men perform live uh, versus, you know, even if they were at Allegiant Stadium here in Vegas where the Raiders play. I think max capacity is 67,000, Yeah, you know, versus if there is a huge group of people in India that love or China that loves boys and men, 40 bucks can turn into literally 1 million people can now watch that sucker live all in the front row seat to be able to uh, hear the love songs of the 90s. So yeah, yeah, it is. It is. You're exactly right, though. It takes away all that congestion that always existed before. Yeah, totally. So that's like really exciting. Um, and, but yeah, I guess um, those were all the questions I had. So I just wanted to leave it to you for any final thoughts or any parting words you want to leave the audience with. I guess the only thing I'll say is uh, what always impacted me the most, especially when I, you told me I had this final thought was uh, just always be open minded and be open to pivot. And you just you don't you know, you have this as an entrepreneur, your end goal is X, Y, Z. You're at ABC. And you're thinking, this is what I want. And sometimes I think that's dangerous to not be open to pivoting. You know, just because you want this end in mind, if the universe or God or whatever is showing you something else, but you're like, but that's not exactly what I want. I would encourage you, be open. You know, there's a lot of things that I don't want to do, but you have to pivot, you know, yeah. to what the market says. I own a video, I still own a video production company, but the reality is... Do you know how many people own video production companies in 2022? There's a lot now. Yeah. And they're only getting cheaper. Uh, and people want work, so they keep on lowering the rates. You know, so for they, it just, it's so competitive. So for me, pivoting was starting BRLU. There's not a lot of people that know how to film in 360. And there's not a lot of people that know how to edit. Specifically, more important is um, edit in 360. So yeah. that's what I mean by pivoting is I didn't have, I'm still in video production. It's just a different format. You know, so for people that are just stuck in their old ways or stuck on this way, in my personal experience of 20 years, that can absolutely kill you to just only be open to doing the things one way and not being open minded to pivot. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, I just want to uh, really quick to uh, plug the event again. So it's July 16th. 
uh, Saturday. It's in Las Vegas, um, 1 to 3 p.m. And I just forgot the name of the library. That's the only thing. Is that the Whitney Library? Whitney Library. To RSVP is 702-602-8802. And then just text the word Melissa. And uh, that way we know you come from here. And then we'll be giving away passes for uh, Black Panther 2. Yeah. So, okay, perfect. So definitely if you're in the Las Vegas area, definitely go to the event, check it out. And then um, also check out your books, Mobilizing People and How to Eat Your Way to Six Figures. They're both on Amazon. And then I'll have links to everything in the podcast description below. But cool. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Super fun. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Entrepreneur Escape Pod. Um, definitely check out James's social media and his upcoming event. I'll have the links to all of that in the podcast description as well. Um, and check me out on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Melissa underscore Rittenhouse. Uh, same on TikTok. It's Melissa underscore Rittenhouse. Or you can find us on Instagram at Entrepreneur Escape Pod as well. And yeah, definitely uh, tune in and check out our next guest next week. Thanks. Bye.